Welcome to the Lunch and Learn podcast from the National Fire Chiefs Council Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Project. This is the first series of podcasts and we urge you to share widely with your friends and colleagues to give greater awareness into equality, diversity and inclusion. These Lunch and Learn sessions have been developed to share knowledge and lived experiences via a Teams meeting discussing topics that affect the fire service across the UK. To mark the Windrush Day, Jodie Findlay talks about racial equality and particularly the history and lived experiences of the Windrush generation. So good afternoon everybody and welcome to the uh, National Fire Chiefs Council Lunch and Learn event and like I said great opportunity for, for us to learn but I do hope that you've got your sandwiches and your cups of tea as well. A couple of thank yous before we start. Firstly thank you very much indeed to Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service and, and Jax I can see you uh, on the line there but but thank you very much because indeed this is a, a sponsored event and thank you to Greater Manchester for, for supporting today's event and indeed our EDI uh, agenda so thank you and the second thank you exceptionally warm and inclusive welcome to Jodie our speaker Jodie Finley today our guest speaker welcome to the NSCC and thank you for for your time today Jodie joins us today to, to kind of uh, talk about race equality and primarily Wimrush but today as we celebrate International Wimrush Day we get the opportunity to to listen to Jodie and I will allow her to introduce herself but you know exceptional experience and somebody really that that is quite prolific and prevalent in the journey for for us to improve race equality. So Jodie a warm welcome on behalf of the National Fire Chiefs Council thank you very much and over to you thank you. Thank you Catherine and hello everyone good afternoon as I said I am from sunny not so sunny Manchester today and um, but yeah I'm Jodie Finlay and I have a background in education as a lecturer and as a performer and as a writer and with Equality Diversity UK I've been delivering workshops for the past two years now on a number of subjects and wing rush is just one of my favourite things to talk about. So I've been researching and learning about Windrush intensely for the last year for my own project, for my own creative execution. So I'm really excited just to tell you about what is Windrush. I don't know how much people know or don't know, but it's just a great generation of people that came to England and contributed so much. And I'm just so glad we get to have, we have Windrush Day and we can celebrate it. So I'm going to start right from the beginning and give you that history lesson and take us right through to today and where we are when it comes to the Windrush generation and their great contributions. So the aim of today is I want to support everyone here to understand the history of the Windrush generation and just those lived experiences. We need to delve in and really hear about the stories, the good and the bad to what happened to a generation of people that came over to the UK. And I just want you to guys to promote the Windrush community and just celebrate everything they did for the UK. So by the end of the course, I want you, well, our session, it's not really a course, is it? But I want you to have learned about the Windrush generation. I want you to know about some more lived experiences and just more accepting of the Windrush generation. That's part of why I'm actually developing my project because I, I want society in the UK to accept the Windrush generation as British citizens who positively contributed to the UK. And um, so through the medium of creativity, that's my kind of drive to shift that mindset. So what is Windrush Day and why is it celebrated? So the Windrush generation refers to West Indians who were invited to come to Britain between 1948 and 1971 in response to a need for skilled labour in, in rebuilding post-war Britain and the later economic booms. Acknowledging and learning about the contributions West Indians have made to post World War II and the industries they faced while doing so, giving staff an opportunity to reflect on diversity, immigration and economic issues. So 1948, this is where it all began. World War II ended and the West Indian community became British. They came over from the Caribbean. So 
I'll break it down further so we get a clear understanding of what was happening at that time. So World War II had ended on May the 8th, 1945. And Britain was a country, it was short of workers, and the economy was broken, it was weak. It needed more people, it needed help. They were needed for production of raw materials such as iron, steel, coal, and food as well. There was a huge backlog of essential maintenance and repair work and severe shortages in the construction sector. In the service sector, both men and women workers were needed to run public transport and to staff the new NHS. So imagine the NHS hadn't even existed. It was brand new. World War II had ended and Britain really needed help. Um, An advertisement appeared in a Jamaican newspaper offering cheap transport to anyone who wanted to find work in post-war Britain. So the UK went over to the Caribbean and they advertised and they wanted people to come over and help with this economy and help the UK get back on its feet, help the NHS evolve. So those advertisements were put out to people in the Caribbean. It was a prospect of employment that attracted many of the Windrush passengers. The Windrush generation, named after the first ship that brought workers from Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago on June the 27th, 1948 were granted indefinite leave to remain in the UK by the 1971 Immigration Act. So in the end, there were laws in place to protect those people that came over and they were granted indefinite leave to remain here in the UK as citizens. Many of the Windrush generation helped fill the labour shortage. However, Those who arrived faced racism, prejudice, discrimination, and they were barred from many aspects of public life and rejected by society. So just imagine at this time where people from Jamaica, people from Trinidad, people from Tobago, they'd come over at this, a career prospect that was going to enhance their lives. And they took that journey and they arrived and it wasn't a great start. And as I mentioned, they face prejudice and discrimination. And I'll talk about that now. So when the Windrush arrived, there was nowhere for them to live. There was nowhere for them to sleep. In Clapham Common, there was a deep air raid shelter that had been built during the war. And the government said that this could be used as a temporary home for the Windrush passengers who had nowhere else to go. So 236 The passengers spent their first days in Britain living in a huge tunnel near Clapham South Underground. It's not what they expected. They expected to come to the UK for a new life, a new start and to prosper. So to arrive and have to live in a tunnel, that was not what they envisioned and it was really hard for them. So when the Windrush migrants arrived, cities that needed their help could not offer them work because there was nowhere to live. Many new migrants started living in hostels until they saved enough money to buy their own property. And some landlords did take advantage of the Windrush generation and were greedy and charged them extortionate rent. So again, how were the Windrush generation treated when they got here? They were subjected to housing discriminations, hostility from the likes of the Teddy Boys, and many from the generation talk about the signs that were out for accommodation and pubs, the no blacks, the no dogs, the no Irish. The majority of the newly arrived people from the Caribbean found poor housing in the city centre, predominantly in St Paul's and Easton. And these places were not living places. They were damaged in the war and they just resembled slums. There were a few areas where landlords would rent to African Caribbean people or African Caribbean people saved up and brought their own property. So that is the Windrush. That's how it all began. This is how it started. It was that advertisement asking people to come over. But unfortunately, they were not treated very well at all. It was very hostile right from the start. So now I'm going to move on to a poem by a colleague of mine who is part of that Windrush generation, who was a child that came over during that time. And she's documented her story in a poem. And as I read this poem, I'd like you to kind of note down maybe some key messages or some thoughts 
about the poem or about the information so far. You can pop thoughts down in the chat um, and and I can read some off after I've read the poem out. I'm going to start with this poem and it's called My Windrush Story. My father arrived in England in 1955. He came to work on an invitation, leaving behind his life. He left his partner and his three children to work hard, share his skills and help prop up the UK economy. I was just a baby, just three and a half weeks old. He left me, my brother and sister. To send for us later, my mother was told. He experienced racism from the day he arrived. He was shaken and sad, not sure he'd survive. He couldn't get anywhere decent to live. He had to settle for rat infested rooms that only rogue landlords would give. He told us of the names he was called, how he was shouted at, spat at and physically mauled. Over the years, he worked hard and settled down despite racism still being rife and still scattered around. When I was five, he sent for us kids to provide us with a better life and somewhere to live. He told us his tales of what he had endured. Listening to his stories, we were never bored. He often told us that the colour of our skin would be a disadvantage. The black shade of our skin would make us stand out and we would encounter, like he did, hatred and shouts. Shouts to go back where we came from. We would forever experience racist names. He told us to study hard, to educate our minds, to rise above the negativity and the racist signs. We all did well in education and employment. We managed our lives and gained some enjoyment. But when he returned to the West Indies in 74, he gave us kids some advice that we are forever grateful for. He told us to apply for naturalization in case the UK, in years to come, considered sending us back. We all listened and did as we were advised. We are grateful to Dad for securing our adult lives. With this certificate, we could be on the plane, never to step foot in the UK again. Our children, too, are thankfully secure, and their children's lives are at risk no more. They invited them in and treated them so badly. They exploited their skills and would send them off gladly, reduce them to tears, depression and mental ill health, despite the West Indians propping up their wealth. The hostile environment that has now come about has created a situation of worry and doubt. Worry about where West Indians' lives will end because Britain seemingly is no longer their friend. My dad came here in 1955 on the UK's invitation The Windrush hostility is a direct result of this situation. We must all join together and support the fight and help West Indian families secure their rights. And that's by Alison Malley. So that's her Windrush story. So would anybody like to kind of feedback or any thoughts about that poem or about the Windrush story so far? You can pop anything in the chat. And it'd be great to hear, I can read some out. We've got some coming on the chat, which is great. It was a really, really amazing poem in to know that person personally as well. So thank you for that, Nikki. Vicky Thomas, heartbreaking to hear such experiences occurred. Definitely. Thank you, Samantha. Invited, left family behind. Very powerful. It shows the resilience of those people who came over to help get UK rebuild and that. And that is the key, the key thing, you know, Windrush Day, the message that we like to put out there is that, you know, people from the West Indies were invited here to help rebuild. And despite the hostility, despite nowhere to live, despite the bad working conditions, they still came here and got on with the job and did it the best they can. Some great comments coming through. Thank you, everyone, for contributing. And we're going to move on and I'm going to, again, I want to look at something positive and just a person, again, within the Windrush generation that really, you know, showed that resilience and is a, a great example of that. And that is Louise de Codia. So Enoch Powell, the Tory health minister from 1960 to 1963, was to invite women from the Caribbean to Britain to train as nurses. 
And Louise was born in St. Catherine, parish of Jamaica, in 1934 and came to Britain in 1955 and started training as a nurse. Again, upon her arrival, Louise was one of the very few black women training to be nurses within the NHS. And despite all the discrimination Louise faced, she took great, great pride in her work and determination and rose to the top of the ranks and had such a successful nursing career. So I've got some more information regarding Louise and her achievements. And she was awarded an MBE for her work in the community as she went on to work in race relations. And in 1966, she became assistant superintendent of district nurses. And she was one of the first black nurses to have a senior role in Manchester Unfortunately, she passed away in 2008 and there was a trust in her honour and there's been some great theatre about her life and the NHS nurses. And uh, Louise firmly believed that anyone could achieve anything through hard work and determination, even despite being discriminated against. She embodied this until the day she died and will remain a positive inspiration for not only black nurses, but for black people aspiring to achieve fulfilling careers despite racism they may face. So Louise is a great example. She came over, she trained as a nurse, she helped the NHS and she had a tough time. But again, she did so much work and her lived experience, you know, drove her to then work in race relations and really helped support other people in the end in the community to thrive. So Louise Kokodia is a great example of someone from the Windrush generation. So we're just going to move on about the Windrush scandal. So we do have a video. We can send this along at the end for everybody to watch. But unfortunately, the Windrush story came prevalent again over the last couple of years. And this is due to the Windrush scandal. So the unfair treatments, all of this barely scratches the surface of the legacy of the Windrush generation here in Britain. Despite their enormous impact on society, a scandal in 2018 has seen some Windrush arrivals deported. So the 1971 Immigration Act came in and was there to protect the Windrush generation. And we get to fast forward all the way to 2018 and they have begun to be deported. So imagine they were brought here. They, a lot of this generation now were in their 60s and they came as children with their parents. So the UK is all they'd ever known. And then now in 2018, they're in their 60s and they're being told they've got to leave. It is, for me, one of the just the biggest scandals I've ever read, heard, felt about it, literally, it really was devastating for the black British community. Though they have lived here since childhood, worked and they paid their taxes for decades, they apparently lacked the right paperwork to be considered British citizens. This begs the question whether the Rindrush generation are truly made to feel welcome after all these years, or are they seen as outsiders? So the challenge is today. Most recently, in 2018, the government had to issue an apology to the children of the Windrush generation after their citizenship status was questioned. No record was kept of those who were allowed to remain in the country after the 1971 Immigration Act granted those who migrated before that year the right to live in Britain indefinitely. After the Home Office had destroyed the landing cards of the Windrush migrants in 2010, it was made even more difficult for people to prove they had the right to be in the country. Many who had been living in the country for decades since they were children faced the threat of deportation. In 2019, the Windrush compensation scheme was set up. However, many still are waiting for this. So with the Windrush scandal, The paperwork was destroyed. And I've done a lot of reading into a book, a great book called The Windrush Betrayal. And unfortunately, the paperwork was deliberately destroyed. And I've spoken with 
individuals that were part of that scandal. And I had a great interview with a lady called Glenda Caesar, and she's she's been on the media and has been very vocal about her experience. And she was working in the UK for many years. And how this scandal evolved is that under Theresa May's government, they really wanted to clamp down on immigration and the Windrush generation fell under that and fell into that scandal. And she was happily living her life working. And because the laws and the policies had began to tighten up and change, she got fired from her job when they realised she didn't have a British passport. So this individual, Glenda, she didn't work for 10 years because, again, she couldn't get the British passport and she kept getting told she wasn't British and she had to leave. And she spent 10 years living in her bedroom because she couldn't afford to heat and live in the rest of her house. And she had many sleepless nights. It caused depression, mental illness. She used to go and collect old trainers, make them up and sell them on. And she really went through the most horrific 10 years of her life. And I sat with her for six hours and she told me everything. And it was truly, truly heartbreaking. And now to be waiting for the compensation is just prolongs the suffering of these people. They've already suffered so, so much. And a lot of these individuals, again, as I mentioned, they're in their 60s. So unfortunately, a few have passed away and haven't received their compensation, and which has been truly devastating. And part of the part of what happened within the scandal, a lot of these people were detained. There's a lady called Paulette who sadly passed away. Her house was broken to in the night and she was taken away and she was taken to a detention centre and she was kept there for days. And she was asked what flight she'd like to get. Bearing in mind, she came here at six months old and it, the UK was the only place she had ever known. So the scandal is unfortunately a big stain on our British history. So we need to learn from it and we need to move forward. And yeah, could we have some more comments in the chat? Would anybody like to say anything or anybody want to contribute at this point? So I know we're, we're halfway. So it'd be good to hear from some more people and just get some thoughts and some key messages, especially about the scandal. Was it something that people didn't know about? Or is this new information? It would be great to hear where what everyone's thoughts are. So thank you, Julie. And um, Julie says feels embarrassed. Where is the humanity? And this is why I'm working on my project because I feel like this story needs to be. You read it in the paper and you see it on the news, but I really genuinely feel people need to sit and experience it emotionally. And for me, as someone creative, I feel like theatre and and performance would be a great way for people just to visually see, feel and hear that experience. Sarah didn't know a lot about it. And that's thing a lot of people did it, even though it was a big news story, a lot of people still don't know about the Windrush scandal and it's heartbreaking. But there's so many positives that have come out of the Windrush generation coming to the UK. So heartbreaking, some people completely unaware of this scandal, which is, it is truly sad. And I've done a lot of research. Did this scandal only apply to those from the Caribbean rather than, yes. So yeah, the Windrush scandal was collectively. So the lady who, who investigated and, and broke the story, she was a reporter. And yes, it was all the children that were brought over with their parents. So it was their parents that came over as part of the Windrush generation, they brought their children over and a lot of their children didn't have passports. They came on their mother or their father's passport. So that's how they came here to the UK. And yes, someone's just shared a link about Paulette. And they're also a great resource is the BBC programme, which was very interesting. Again, that was sitting in limbo. And again, that was about a gentleman and he was just sitting on his sofa and he was waiting to be detained because he knew it was going to happen. Um, Samantha, you've got your hand up. Did you want to say something? You can unmute yourself if you like, if you did want to speak, or did you pop it in the chat? Yeah, I, I don't mind. <laughs> yeah, 
Thank you. I did put it in the chat, but yeah, just to, just to say that I think that a lot of us saw and heard what was happening in terms of the Windrush scandal and didn't realise how close it was to us. So, so Paula in the in the chat is somebody that works. She works at a local pub that I used to go to all the time, and and obviously didn't know. I didn't know what was what was happening until the kind of scandal all, all happened and what happened to her happened. You know, so it really brought it really close to home, but. I think as as a kind of like services, fire services or whatever services, I think we need to just kind of like recognise that, you know, we're connected to the story through people in our service, through our communities and, and just to just recognise that there's opportunities to, to engage through just supporting people who are still going through this whole whole madness and this, this kind of hostile environment. Yeah, so, we've yeah. all that. Uh... Yeah, I've read I read a lot into Paulette's story about what happened to her and she got detained and she was detained about three times. And then she had to report to the immigration office in Birmingham every week with her daughter. And and again, just imagine going there every week with your daughter, basically having to say, like, I'm still here and I'm I'm still an illegal immigrant. And um, she says one day she went there and it was a young guy. And he said to her, why don't you just go back to where you came from? And and there was another lady, Sarah O'Connor. She's from Wolverhampton as well. And she's she managed to get a citizenship and literally died a month later. And again, it was really sudden. And again, everyone's saying it was just the heartbreak and the stress of what she'd been through that had killed her. And like me and you from the Midlands, so obviously Wolverhampton, again, was a place that has a big West Indian immigration and for me it's part of why I exist because I am a mixed race person from Wolverhampton and again that hostility was there with my mother who was white and she entered a relationship with a black man so because of that hostility in the 70s she brought shame on her family and unfortunately was disowned by them so I never met the white side of my family and that is that is such a common thing with this, you know, with the integration of the UK and the Caribbean, made these mixed race relationships. And it what for, for some white women, it was a really distressing time. And I know for my mother, it was a really distressing time. I have another friend of mine, he was even told by his own mother he was adopted because she had an affair with a black man and didn't want the family to know. So she said the baby died and she had adopted her own child just as the story to tell people because she would rather say she adopted the child than give birth to a child by a black man so you know that's a lived experience I don't know Samantha if you have anything you want to share you don't have to about just your lived experience growing up with your family it'd be good to hear I was just going to say that you a lot, like I said a lot of the time you don't even realize you have when I mean, my parents came from the Caribbean in Jamaica not during the Windrush time but not long after that you know and I only really understand now, <laughs> to be honest, about some of the things that they went through. My my parents were very tolerant and actually are very, very patriotic <laughs> and, you know, what have a word said against the system, really, because they're very grateful. We are we're all kind of like a little bit grateful, but but I suppose a little bit more aware of, of the things that have happened and want to make a want to make a, a difference, I suppose, now with the awareness raising particularly. So yeah we do need to think about this is a celebration and like I said that awareness and supporting the community within within your roles within the within the fire service and I do have some kind of figures here you know it's great that everybody's come to this but I think it's now time for us to self-reflect like I said Samantha like what are we doing and some facts here that in 2020 95.6% of firefighters in England were white so within the fire service, we do need we do need more diversity in there. It's there in the facts that unfortunately the majority of those firefighters are white. So education is the key. How do we do better? It's just it's education and it's self awareness. And I've done a lot of unconscious bias. We sometimes we act, react say things feel things unconsciously we don't realize that we're doing it so sometimes we're in a tunnel vision with our thoughts and it's really about stepping out and building that awareness and embracing all those other communities 
for me with the Windrush, when I think about the Windrush contribution, I just think about music because I am just, as again, as a creative person, I think about UK Garage because it's like my favourite genre of music. I think about UK Jungle. I think about all the genres of music and all the artists that we listen to on the radio. And none of that would have existed if it wasn't for the Windrush generation coming over. So I'd like maybe some people to put in the chat just anything positive that we can kind of promote the Windrush generation. And we've got some great things coming over in the chat. So we've got Matthew. Matthew, did you want to jump in and say anything? You've got a good story, but I don't know. I can read it in the chat or you can speak if you like. No problem. Yeah, my father-in-law came over in the 60s, passed away now, but he was from Trinidad and Tobago, came over for a couple of years, him and his some of his sisters, but lived down in sort of Shepherd's Bush area, did not stay here, would not stay here, went back, but even sort of lived in the States much later but always really complimentary of sort of, oh, you get your pension and you get your health care and all of that and how well looked after. So when my husband sort of came here from the States, he was always like, oh, you've got to stay there. They'll look after you. But is it any better? <laughs> and it was all sort of that sort of story as well. But it's massively different. But a lot of his family were here and trained sort of it's got sort of most of the women in his family are sort of nurses and whatnot but now in the states but trained up here in the sort of 60s and 70s so definitely Windrush and I'm glad that they're not here because they would have fallen foul of all of that and that sounds awful but you don't uh, being forced out of where you've grown up and taken from your family and everything that you know it's just horrific but it's exactly what the government set out to do by getting rid of those documents but yeah it's yeah. just it's sickening i think yeah i think it is an example of institutional racism the scandal from my reading and my research of the windrush betrayal that is what it is and that's why i wanted i want to this story to be told yeah. It absolutely is yeah because it's just it's, if someone says what's institutional racism i'll say the windrush scandal that's literally my example to people, if you don't understand. So we've got a couple more hands up. Did someone want to jump in? Hello, everyone. Uh, my Hello. Name is John Maddox from the Sci Fire and Rescue Service. I think I'd just like to comment really on, on the, the great presentation that I've seen today. And um, I think it's just imper- it's pertinent to sort of acknowledge that, that the, some of these issues that we're talking about, the generations being this has been occurring so it's it's a really complex issue that will take massive strides and a and massive sea change in, in, in people to make a difference so i think all of us on the call today if they can just take something small out of it and go back to their own organization and make a a small difference i think it, it's really important and and the other aspect for me is is constructively challenging it anyone within the workplace any 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 comment that you feel uncomfortable with i think it's up to everybody to take some personal responsibility really and challenge that thank you thank you john that's great definitely i think now especially over the last 12 months it's you know we need people to speak up you know if you hear something in my advice to anyone that's never challenged someone if you're in work and you hear something all you have to say is what did you mean by that that would be the way that's that's my advice to someone to how to respond to situations at work just ask that person what did you mean by that and then you can start to have a conversation and you can really explore what the meaning was and what the intention was you know we have unconscious bias but we also have implicit bias so that is just a simple kind of key advice i will give to you all today is that if it's in ne- if it's next week or it's in a month you know and you're at work and you hear something start off by just asking them what they mean and that is a way to you know to really explore deeper into that situation we've got another hand up would you like to jump in yeah hi it's barry scott from great manchester fire and rescue service i just wanted to just to share something that what we've been doing around moss side with the nhs windrush and the caribbean festival really so what we've done in Moss Side over the past couple of years is the, we've held an event with joint partnership as well, celebrating music and giving opportunities to young people 
to perform and also creating opportunities to actually apply for different services and good jobs for all really and from from my perspective from uh, face-to-face engagement people didn't think it was an option and by giving them this opportunity it's become so valuable and we're actually starting to see that we're actually getting more applications and we're actually having crews that represent the diverse communities that we serve so it's just something really going going forward that's been really positive and if anybody ever gets a chance to come down to one of these events they need to come down and try and replicate it if possible because we've seen real positive action from it that's great thank you scott i live in wally rain so i'm not far <laughs> have you not been down to the windrush or caribbean festival with us well i moved here in the lockdown so <laughs> well, I'll see you at the next one. And I'll see you at yeah, I will be at the next one, but that's great. So yeah, Windrush Day today. So Windrush Day will allow communities up and down the country to recognise and honour the enormous contribution of those who stepped ashore at Tilbury Docks 70 years ago. We need to keep the legacy alive. Again, it's for the future generations. I know someone in the chat says about learning history at school you know educating the young and keeping it keeping the Windrush story alive and again I like this last quote the diversity of our society is its greatest strength and gives us so much to celebrate so I'd like to hear from you all again just with how do we move forward and uh, what are the key learning points you've learned or you feel about the Windrush generation today it'd be great to hear some maybe people come and speak or pop it in the chat Sorry, I don't want to hog the limelight and let anybody S- else come in. Oh, Samantha again, so I can just see SS, <laughs> Samantha, jump on. <laughs> no, I was just gonna, I was just gonna say about the history thing. I think I've started to have a different way of thinking about about things like this in terms of, yeah. of history. So I know that it's being called like Black History, but this is actually British history, <laughs> and it's like. You know, we, we understand that stuff like this isn't taught in schools and there's a lot of other stuff that's not taught in schools. But I think, you know, we have to really just align it in the way that we talk about it. And we, we have to start saying that we just want British history to be in schools, <laughs> modern history, I suppose you'd call this. But, but you know, just having that in our schools rather than it being called black history because it's not. <laughs> Do you know what yeah. I mean? I'm reading a book, which is a good one, Samantha, or anybody else, called Black and British by David Olasaga. I'm reading the kids' version because it's three hours long on Audible. But again, he talks about, you know, all the history we learn in school, you know, the Tudors, the Jordans, everything. But he talks about where black people were in this. So again, he's like, you get taught this in school, but black people were there and this is where they were and this is what was happening to them. And so it's just... You know, and like you said, we, we need to bring it together and just talk about it as history. But unfortunately, the history that's taught is just from one lens. So, yeah, if anybody wants to learn about black history, like a quick go to guide, then yes, Black and British by David Olasaga is a good one because it's a, a little book and it's just that quick beginners. And then you can kind of really delve in it in, in more historical books. Um, did anybody else want to come in? with any more comments or feedback. So thank you, Scott Barry. He's popped some uh, information in the chat too. Did anybody want to share anything or discuss anything regarding the Windrush generation? I think the positives are the NHS, especially in this time with COVID, the Windrush generation, again, many of them on the front line and just helping with the, you know, the last year of COVID and Deborah really agrees with Samantha. My grandson, age 10, reads my weekly junior. Oh, that's great. And articles on the Windrush. So, yeah, what can we do? We can educate our children, definitely. Within our workplace, we can speak up. What can we do? We can challenge our unconscious bias. How do we integrate with communities? What is our what's the echo chamber of our lives what does it look like who do we interact with what's our friendship circle like you know there's so much diversity in our society that we can explore and integrate and learn more netflix that is literally my bible netflix if you want to know about lived experiences there's theater there's netflix there's films there's lots of way that we can learn 
Um, so I'm going to open up the last section for any questions that anybody might want to ask again about the Windrush generation, about diversity, how, how we can do better, or if anybody wants to speak or contribute anything or anything that they're doing, again, like what was mentioned about the events, just so we can all learn together in a space and discuss how we celebrate diversity and the Windrush generation. So we've got lots of people agreeing uh, with Nikki. That was great. Lots of people integrating in the chat. Did anybody want to say anything or ask any questions? So we've got Jax. Hello, Jax. <laughs> hi, hi, Georgie. That was fabulous. Thank you so much. And for me, I just think it's really important that uh, we look at our staff networks and support our networks. Those members step up in a voluntary capacity and give up a lot of their time because of their passion around inclusion and equality. And I think let's try and support as active allies or find out about your networks. And if you haven't got a network, think about setting one up for your fire and rescue service. I think it's really important. I know the EDI forum at NFCCC, we're looking at networks and how we can support networks better. And so we can share some great examples of where they're established and doing really well and support people who want to set up networks as well. So I just wanted to contribute that. Thanks. Thank you, Jax. Yeah, brilliant. Setting up the networks, interacting with equality and diversity on a regular basis. JM has, has their hand up. I can just see initials. Would you like to say something? Yeah, sorry, just on the back of that. In Merseyside, we've re we started our own Black Network, or Bay Network, sorry. Obviously, just just for anyone on the call, really, if they wanted any advice or sort of information on that and how to go about it, I'd be willing to correspond with anyone in terms of emails and stuff. But we've had a lot of challenges, really, in terms of obviously getting people to become involved. And it's what you alluded to before. A lot of people are a bit reticent about, about joining some of the, the networks because they feel like they're putting their, their head above the parapet and suddenly they're bringing attention to themselves. But... I can only speak for Merseyside's organisation, but I think we sort of the sentiments are in the right place, and we just want to try and make sure that the organisation continues to improve and is in a much better place. Brilliant, that's great. Thank you, John. So there's so much great work that is being done, you know, across the service, and yeah, it's just we have to regularly check in, regularly learn, keep evolving. And just, I think, lived experiences is the best way. Yaz has got a great comment. We also have a really good multicultural staff support network, which we set up last year. We would also be happy to share how we've set this up and some of the challenges we have faced too. So, yeah, it, it's amazing. The fire service seemed to me that they really want to move forward. And, again, for that next generation, you can't be what you can't see. And within the fire service needs to represent our society. So let's get everybody in the fire service, just like everyone in society. So Nikki, every every one of us can take at least one small action. Definitely. That combined will make a difference to people, 100%. So yeah, it's speaking up, it's challenging and it's educating. And I think self-awareness, the higher self-awareness you are, the more that you will be able to practice equality, diversity and inclusion across the board, but not just at work and then you leave work. It's It's got to be a whole lifestyle change. It's got to be in work and out of work. I know a lot of people are having to leave, so thank you for coming. I have got, again, more time for questions. If anybody would like to ask anything or want like any advice, again, regarding equality, diversity and inclusion, but I hope this has been a great little positive lunchtime workshop for you. Again, just to take a time to reflect about Windrush, reflect about the story and reflect about, I know it was heartbreaking and the resilience, but there's so much positivity. And again, for me, I wouldn't be here today and be the person I wasn't if it wasn't for the Windrush generation. So to me, it's, you know, it's something really personal. Thank you, everyone. If anyone does have to leave, does anyone have any more questions at all? Hi, hi, Jody. It's, it's, Hello. it's all good afternoon, and thank you for for a fascinating, uh, informative, and inspiring presentation and, and wonderful uh, feedback and stories that people also shared in in the chat uh, and, and verbally. Uh, it's just just a comment, perhaps, and, and to some wonderful initiatives and and, uh, and ideas 
being shared, very very inspiring, and I think we we need that. Uh, I think what what I'm taking away from here that we we need that uh, reminder every day or, or every week, uh, not not to wait for another winterish day or, or or Black History Month. Uh, look look out and engage locally with local communities and and groups and initiatives, and and see where else can we can we engage with the community. To, to inspire young generation, whether these are after school clubs or, uh, or, or summer, sc- summer schools organized by local uh, black community organizations uh, and, and, and other organizations locally uh, and, and initiatives where we can be part of. Uh, and I think that's just an important message to, uh, that we want to share with the community that uh, that, that that the service is we are part of the of the community as as a public uh, public service so uh, and i think with that we also you, you mentioned that so, uh, about the challenge and sometimes this is uncomfortable but we need we need to uh, uh, but that that part of the of the journey to to understand and to learn brilliant uh, that's right you. couldn't have said it better myself <laughs> i think we're um just coming to the end there but um Jodie thank you so much I mean you can see the messages there goodness me oh, um, such lovely messages absolutely. it's great it's been Absolute. lovely it's been nice to talk about Windrush like such a lovely thing for me to talk about it's great oh, and, and it it's really has like, been it's nice that everyone contributed as well it's really nice to hear from people as well and their thoughts and their work that they're doing it's really inspiring no definitely and I think that almost the, the three bits I've definitely picked out um, is celebrate challenge and then change because I think whilst it you know absolutely through every celebration there is a massive story and the celebration of Wimrush Day we certainly see a huge significant story that that sits behind it I think we've all agreed today that um, and I know it's Wayne Brown that talks about being uncomfortable because challenge is uncomfortable but again if we're not challenging then indeed we are condoning behavior and the only way we're really going to be able to change and move things on is to to actually challenge and also learn more about diversity why it's important why it's important to our inclusion agenda thank you for recognizing the the work that we are trying to do in fire services you're absolutely right with the figures but um you know we certainly are seeing from national fire chiefs that you know quality diversity and inclusion is absolutely front and center in our agenda for change and again you've picked up on the you know again I, I, the people in the chat as well have picked up today that understanding the value of diversity is so important as we move forwards we've also got a quality of access documents that are available we've got one on black people again hopefully services can use those documents to see how we can engage with our communities and how we can improve diversity for for our workforce as well and you know absolutely Jack's picked up on and yourselves about networks and the power that networks have in allowing people to that maybe wouldn't always put their hands up and put their head above the parapet to have a voice because everyone's voice is so important. But thank you so much for today. Yeah, I was just going to say, can we all come off mute and give Jodie a round of applause? <laughs> Wait. You mentioned the word there about giving hope, and I think that's certainly one thing, goodness me, if you think back to when when people stepped on the shores of Britain I mean goodness me they were they were full of hope and what they went through but to keep that hope was was phenomenal so I think that's a a beautiful word to probably end the session with is is hope for the future thank you very much indeed everybody and again thank you Jodie and again thank you very much indeed to Greater Manchester hope you have found this podcast useful and it has given you insight into the Windrush generation. All Lunch and Learn sessions are available at www.ukfrs.co.uk.